and welcome to the itinerary. COVID-19's impact on the tourism industry has many commenting that this is our chance to rethink tourism and make the necessary changes that will improve our industry going forward. And while there have been many suggestions for change and calls for action, tourism will still face the challenges of the long-held stigma that surrounds it. Just the word tourism comes with baggage we haven't been able to shake from perceptions about the workforce, it being considered a bum subject in schools, worry about environmental impact, our locals even scoffing in the distance about tourists. However, the industry is an economic powerhouse for Aotearoa, so how do we get people to take us more seriously and like us better? For years now, there has been talk about redefining tourism as the visitor economy or the visitor experience. The World Travel and Tourism Council defines this as any direct or indirect and induced economic activity resulting from visitors' interactions with a destination, which can obviously include several more sectors than what we typically associate with tourism. So it's time for a rebrand, is it? Well, let's discuss it. We've got Chris Roberts, the CEO of Tourism Industry Aotearoa TIA, Dr. Suzanne Beckin, Professor in Sustainable Tourism at Griffith University in Australia and Principal Advisor for the Department of Conservation, Linda Keane, CEO of Tourism Export Council, TEC, and Lisa Hopkins, CEO of Business Events Industry Association, also known as BEIA. So let's get down to it. The Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment currently consider nine sectors to fall under tourism, accommodation, food and beverage and services, road, rail and water and transport, air and space transport, travel and tour services, rental and hiring services, arts and recreation, retail trade, education and training. Do we think that this is accurately representing the industry? Chris, what's your thoughts? Well, tourism actually falls under those categories, and that's because tourism is such a diverse thing. Uh, so a tourism operator could be considered the fuel station on the West Coast that's only there largely to, to serve visitors coming to the region because it wouldn't sustain itself with just the local population. Uh, and so that's just one example of how diverse our sector is. And that's why uh, Statistics New Zealand, MB, government agencies in general, really struggle to categorise tourism. And we end up in these multitude of, of categories. Uh, and uh, the question always comes down to just what is a tourism business? And uh, even uh, for your panellists here who um, are deeply involved in tourism on a daily basis, um, we struggle to have one definition of what tourism is. I, I think that can be said. Lisa, I know sitting from where you sit and the organisation you sit, what, what do you think is representing our industry fairly? Well, I, th I think the events industry sort of is an interesting one because sort of what Chris was saying, we're all contributing to tourism. You know, people come to our country, they travel to our country or they travel within our country to meet face to face. At the same time, they're using hotels, they're using restaurants, they're using they're, they're accessing activities that a, a tourist, a, a fully independent traveller may also do. So it becomes more around, are we more in that, um, and we use the term visitor economy, or are we that economic powerhouse? Where do we sit? It's really still quite murky, and uh, I think the good clarity is required. I think that's true. Linda, I know that you have spoken about this before. What's your thoughts? I think tourism is a industry that... Um, covers all the sectors that you've just uh, referenced, um, including heritage. And if you need to put labels on it, it's a little bit like the dairy industry. It, tourism is very, very complex because so many categories feed into it. And when I was working in Kaikoura after the earthquake, if you'd asked a retailer, a souvenir shop, um, a cafe or restaurant, the fuel station, um, are you a beneficiary of tourism? Um, the answer might have been, oh, yeah, kind of. After the earthquake, if you ask them the same question, they would say most definitely, because if you are hosting visitors through your business, then you are part of that tourism and hospitality sector. But it's very complex. It's much broader, deeper, wider than many politicians have ever given the thought to it. We've grown up with dairy and the agricultural sector and primary industry since day dot of New Zealand being born. New Zealand's tourism really kicked into gear in the late 1970s. So because Kind of like it's still a new industry, but it's critical to our economy and our communities. 
Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Uh, Suzanne, obviously, Department of Conservation sits within tourism as well. And uh, I'm, I'm sure at times you're asked why and how. Um, what's what's your view on it? Because obviously you, you, you probably will take a little bit of a different perspective with your sustainable hat on, but also Department of Conservation. Well, it's, it's funny that you ask because uh, they always say Department of Conservation is the single largest uh, tourism operator, but of course we're not an industry. We're, we're a public sector organisation. So... I think it depends um, what the purpose is. Uh, why do we need to define tourism? Um, the reason why it's done for the satellite account in those categories that you bundled up, uh, Matt, was to measure the economic impact. And, and just uh, as a fun fact, in India, for example, jewelry and leather is part of tourism because obviously that's what tourists buy. So in New Zealand, it might be something else. But, but from a doc perspective and maybe sustainability, we're probably more interested in the outcomes. And so visitor economy might be one thing. I've been thinking maybe we're in the well-being economy. You know, what does tourism actually contribute? So it depends on the purpose, how we define it, I think. I think that's interesting. There, there are many scenarios where tourism and hospitality are considered to be a combined industry and many other occasions where they're kept separate, uh, depending who you talk to as well. What are the views of this panel in regards to the integration of these sectors in the way they are? Linda, if I may, just throw to you first. Yeah, I think when we go back to how New Zealand's um, tourism industry evolved, first it comes with infrastructure. So it comes with obviously airlines, airline connectivity, um, coaching, hotels, uh, which then feeds into the hospitality sector. And then you have all the very, very different things coming off out of servicing someone from a food and beverage point of view, um, you know, sourcing local produce. You know, a local farmer is actually a beneficiary of tourism if they are selling their produce to a luxury lodge. So they do go hand in hand, but they do have some specific differences as well, um, particularly with hospitality, accommodation, restaurants, cafes, bars, beverage, breweries, wineries, you know, they have the sale of liquor act that they have to deal with, as hotels do, as tourism operators do. So, so there's a lot of similar traits, but there's also a number of differences. Now, Chris, obviously, you, you represent tourism industry RTO. You have accommodation in there. I know that we've been in discussions together at times where hospitality, food and beverage gets a little bit, you know, convoluted at times. What, what's your view on the integration of these sectors? And, you know, do you feel that they are truly representative under tourism currently? Look, I think uh, for some of the students watching this episode, they may be familiar with Venn diagrams and, and there's probably quite a complex Venn diagram you could build around this. So you've got tourism and those activities and operators who, who clearly come under tourism. Then you've got hospitality and then there's a big overlap between those two in your Venn diagram. You could throw an events industry in there. You could possibly throw in conservation and recreation uh, and all of these different areas that uh, can be looked at separately, actually overlap with each other. And, and so you could go quite broad and say all of that's tourism or visitor related. It's all about people moving around, um, uh, undertaking an experience or activity or, 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 or service. Uh, but in the end, we probably don't want to get too um, caught up in, in just trying to defer, uh, de determine who's in and who's out of the camp, because without a doubt, we all have to work together. We're all part of the same system, uh, and without each other, um, things just uh, will fall apart. So um, whether we're in, inside or outside of the Venn diagram, we have to work together. Yeah, I agree. Let's chat about that potential shift then from tourism to the visitor economy, perhaps. Like Lisa, let's start with you, because I imagine that this newly defined industry would better suit the business event sector than what tourism did. What's your view on that, if we were to go with visitor economy? Yeah, because I guess, you know, one of the things that we've often talked about is that uh, someone who's attending a business event tends to be... Um, uh, a, a more valued visitor, a higher, sorry, not a more valued, a higher valued visitor. They they tend to come here, they will stay in uh, four, four and a half, five star accommodation, they will travel around, they'll take the opportunity to travel around the country, they'll eat in restaurants. And, and the one thing I will say about hospitality, and I'd love to, Chris, we have to sit down and do that Venn diagram yeah. one day, I think that would be a great <laughs> idea. And then we'll, let's give it to the minister. Um, we have to um, also think about, you know, the sector 
supports the economy, especially during the time when perhaps our traditional tourism seasons are low. So Monday to Friday, for example, it's the the business events which are holding meetings, conferences, whatever, during the week, eating at restaurants, staying in these hotels, which typically and traditionally may be a little quieter. And during those off-peak times, that's peak time for our sector when they want to come in and they want to take advantage of perhaps not too many people around using some of the great facilities and the infrastructure we have in place. So uh, the contribution means that if you look at it and if you perhaps drew a line, we could have a consistent delivery of economic benefit from the sector all year round in a very consistent and and hopefully sustainable way as well. Suzanne, we've had many discussions before about shifting from the, you know, calling it tourism to potentially the visitor economy or visitor experience. What What's your view? I mean, it, it's interesting. I went to Hui uh, in uh, Picton not so long ago to talk with, with the local um, Ivy, and um, we had this discussion um, that domestic travellers, um, and, and some of you may have heard that no doubt, uh, domestic people don't want to be called tourists. And in fact, the Ivy said, even the word traveller, so for them it's Manuhiri, so it's the visitor. Mm -hmm. and, and that has, of course, a lot of connotations of how you behave, how you appreciate, how you respect. So I, I could see a bit of shift um, in that direction. And, and in, in that sense, tourism is probably a bit, it's just connotated with that slightly um, industrialised model of tourism and something maybe we do want to move away from. And language does yeah. matter sometimes. It, it does, and we can see that play out sometimes with our politicians, don't we? So, yeah. you know, we, we have many RTOs and economic agencies already using the word or, or describing mm. it as the visitor economy to guide their businesses as their destination gains mm. great value from sectors like international students, major events and business events like Lisa was talking about. So why aren't these sectors widely accepted as part of the tourism industry as such? That they are, and, and you know, under a satellite account, but if we're in a secondary school, for instance, hospitality is towards hospitality, tourism is actually taught as travel, you know, do we see any benefit in having these additional sectors within the same industry? Linda, if I, if I could go to you first. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the term the visitor economy. And I think for um, everyone on the panel today, we've been using the term the visitor economy for a very long time, you know, probably a decade what we probably haven't been so great at is educating the politicians um, and our mainstream New Zealand communities that we have had this shift. Um, you know, we've had, had sustainability throughout the tourism industry for three decades. But the shift with using the term the visitor economy, it's just a softer term. And it's easier to see if you had the visitor economy at the top and then all the subsectors underneath it. It might be this Venn diagram or, you know, a, a traditional hierarchy chart might make it easier to understand. And then all those... Um, uh, all the integrated uh, integrated um, ways that the industry, tourism and hospitality talk to talk to each other. I also really like the term a tourism ecosystem, but maybe moving forward when we look at helping the government to define, um, you know, a high value visitor <laughs> or um, what does a luxury or premium visitor, um, what's that type of definition? I think if we try to wrap it into all the four well-beings now with our uh, with a similar conversation, then maybe we can perhaps begin to see a little bit more shift. The problem with the word tourism, one of the problems is we tend to think when we think of international tourists that everyone across coming across our border, when that's possible, uh, is a, a tourist or a holiday maker. But um, actually, fewer than less than half of our arrivals are here on holiday. They're coming here, the rest are coming for a whole host of other region, uh, yeah. reasons. But we're labelling them all or thinking about them all as tourists. So um, I certainly encourage anyone, um, despite the fact that tourism's in our name and is in so many other people's names, and we're, we're, we're not going to go to the trouble of changing our names. But if the more we can talk about visitors uh, coming here and, and that we're hosting our visitors or guests, yeah. Uh, and that we're looking after our destination or our range of destinations around New Zealand. So the more that language can start being used, uh, then it's a much, uh, well, it's more accurate 
because uh, not everyone is a camera wearing uh, activity enjoying tourist. They're here for a whole range of reasons and undertake a whole lot of different activities. So um, I think um, it's incumbent on all of us uh, to slowly change that language, but uh, it, it's, it is a slow change. And, and you and I have talked before about for our young people, uh, their perception of tourism, they think it's all about being a travel agent or uh, an air attendant. Um, and, and we've got to move beyond that because there are so many jobs, so many aspects uh, uh, of the visitor economy to work in. Yeah, Matt, I if I, if, Matt, yeah if please I, do. I just, just wanted to jump in here with one thing. So we made a conscious decision last year to change our brand, and I'm not by any means suggesting any changes to anyone else. But for us, it was important that we start to be recognised as the business events industry, Aotearoa, versus SINs, which was Conventions and Incentives New Zealand. And the reason why we did that is because that really reflected a shift in the in, in what it was that we did as an industry versus just being, you know, bringing people together, having this little bit of a junket and everyone having just a really good time. No, there's actual... Um, business metrics, ROIs, real solid, valid reasons why people come together. And a lot of those reasons do impact on business, on different sectors, on, on communities. So for us, it was important to change. And then as you start to look around the country, what you're starting to see is a lot of what were traditionally convention bureaus are now changing into you know, business events, Southland, or or you know, using that terminology. So it is it is possible to change. Now that is a global a approved way of describing our industry. Can we get the world to describe tourism as the visitor economy? That in itself would be an interesting one. Yeah, that's interesting. So what you've said is is, is interesting when we think of a long haul versus short haul domestic audience. We're, we're getting into that target market. You know, we used to focus so heavily on our guests in the international market. We're now focusing domestically. Do we need to change that narrative domestically as well then, Lisa? Well, I think what we've seen in the past, uh, and I, I, I hope you know, you, the, the rest of the panel will concur, is that what we've seen in the past has been just this incredible outpouring of hey yeah we've we've got a great country that we can do things in and we can visit and experience um that's not to say that we can discount international you know in my sector we're building three international convention centers and a whole host of hotels those babies need to be filled with something and it is not going to be just by a domestic audience so at some point we are going to have to look uh, look outside of our borders just picking up what Lisa was saying there, um, there is uh, a beneficial outcome of, of the pandemic in terms of New Zealanders falling in love with their own country and understanding what there is in New Zealand. Uh, and what that means for us is they will hopefully become our biggest supporters in terms of tourism or uh, the visitor economy. Um, they, they are now experiencing, uh, for many, the uh, for the first time visiting certain parts of the country, what it's like to be a visitor in their own country. So they are not only um, going to be the host, but also the manahuri. And so um, there's a possibility, I hope, that we're building a greater understanding of what uh, visitors bring to every region of New Zealand. And that can only be a good thing. And then we, we need to capture that, capture that new greater understanding when those borders do finally open. Because the, the, the one thing we need to do uh, is to sh show that manaki tanga to our international visitors when they do return. Yeah, there are some views that we're going to see a big shift in travel behaviours going forward thanks to COVID and environmental concerns and that New Zealand's new target market will be limited to domestic audience anywhere, basically, uh, with a shorter flying distance. Um, Linda, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on this and how will it change an audience or redefining our industry as such? The desire for people to travel um, around the world is not going to change once each country begins to get higher vaccination rates and um, there's a little bit more settlement in each of the communities and the economies. You know, people travel for so many different reasons, you know, to explore, to learn, to discover, for religious reasons, for um, 
business re- reasons, obviously visiting family and friends. That's not going to change. When the New Zealand border opens, we know there's really high demand for international visitors to come to New Zealand because they like the way New Zealand has managed COVID. They know we have a world-class offering. Um, every visitor that has been here um, since day dot, they have, have become our own ambassador, and so the word has spread around the world. What I think will shift a little bit, so we know the demand is there, we know we're still a world-class destination. I think we're probably going to get moved from about 8th, ninth, or 10th on a bucket list for travel up to 1, 2 or 3. Uh, so that's encouraging. But how we manage things is going to be the next phase that New Zealand has to seriously put the thinking into now. We know when the border opens, 4 million people aren't going to come back overnight. It's going to be phased. It's going to take a number of years. Um, but sustainability is going to be at the forefront. Sa- health and safety and a business being able to demonstrate that they have the right COVID health protocols in place, that's going to be really, really important. So I think those two things, sustainability and health and safety, they're they're going to drive um, the conversion, I guess, of someone dreaming of coming to New Zealand and being here on the ground. So we must do the work now to make sure we can deliver on that expectation when the visitor arrives. But I'm really keen to hear Suzanne's views on sustainability (laughs) and and some of the changes and trends that she's seeing. (laughs) Because I'm probably a little bit less optimistic. I do agree that people want to travel. I mean, I think all of us on the call um, love to travel and and be involved in tourism. Um, Whether they will travel around the world, um, I doubt that. Um, I'd give you an example of um, my home country, Germany, and uh, you would have seen the devastating flooding events. And I mean, climate change is absolute top of the agenda with politicians, but also the population. So what we saw before COVID around flight shame and sort of feeling, uh, starting to feel a bit embarrassed about jumping on a plane, I think that will start to kick in much more that people feel because it's coming home now. I mean, we've seen the bushfires in Australia and so on. Um, I won't go into the details because you can see the headlines, but it, it is coming much closer to home and people feel increasingly that it's irresponsible. Now, what that means for New Zealand as a long haul destination, I've actually just last night uh, read one of the latest um, reports on aviation technology and and what's out there, hydrogen and, and hybrid and you name it. Um, the, the, the 10 second nutshell is that yes, there's options, but they will be much more expensive and they won't exist at that same scale. So I think this idea of value creating, so we might have fewer tourists um, and they might stay longer, they might um, experience our what we have to offer. We get more value, everyone gets more value. I think that'll be the way to go. Whether it will be four million or five ever again, um, mm. I would be probably more hesitant, but let, let's see. Let, let's make sure we get the most out of those who actually want to come and give them a great experience. I agree. Look, obviously, we've got a lot of different sustainable practices going on and and redefining tourism. We obviously have the UNDG goals. We have the tourism sustainability commitment. We have Tiaki promise. Is that also confusing in how we're trying to redefine sustainability and obviously tourism at the same time? Or no, it's all assisting? Or what's your view? I actually think the world is looking at New Zealand. Um, We are doing so many amazing things. Uh, We have an incredible reputation in the moment. Due to our prime minister, but many other things, um, the COVID response, uh, working with with Mari, coming up with new ways of doing things. So I think what we have started doing, and we can now accelerate. And obviously, the sustainability commitment for TIA is one thing that Yaki you mentioned. I actually think we we can really lead the world um, truly on showing how, at least once people are in New Zealand, um, how sustainable tourism can look like. Working with the community and EV at place. I, I think there's a huge opportunity. And Chris, I know that your organisation does, as does everyone's here, do a lot of work in sustainability. What, how do you think sustainability will help redefine tourism, especially with this Gen Z generation and how they care so much about our environment? Look, I think being sustainable is just an inevitable requirement for a tourism business and for everyone in New Zealand tourism. And uh, I think we're probably, we're by no means... Um, got everything sorted in that space and we do need to do better to let everyone know how those different elements that are currently at play um, fit together. Uh, But we actually have an opportunity here to lead the world in this area 
uh, because it, it fits so well with what New Zealand tourism is all about. Uh, and so we, we as New Zealanders um, understand about being kaitiaki for this place. And we understand that when our uh, manuhiri come, that they also need to respect this place and treat it correctly. So um, I think we're, we're well on track to achieve that. We, we are still seeing, despite all the challenges of the pandemic, a really strong industry commitment to sustainability in the future. Uh, and that's really, really encouraging. Uh, and so no matter how many people we end up coming here, uh, and we do our very best not to talk about numbers, we talk about having quality visitors and delivering a quality service to them. And, and that's where our businesses can focus. Is their business the quality business it needs to be? Are their staff the quality staff that they need? Are they providing those staff with the quality opportunities? Because if we actually focus on quality, um, sustainability comes with that. It's, it's absolutely uh, uh, incorporated into being a quality business. Yeah, and, and Linda, do you think flight shaming and sustainability will potentially affect our audience? Yeah, I, I, I do think it will have some some impact. It's going to depend on what is the motivation or the desire for visitors to, to travel around the world. Um, I think there will be certain markets that may be more hesitant to travel um, because they may have a stronger focus on their own countries, climate change, um, uh, focus and strategies and uh, their own sustainability practices. There will be some other markets that um, don't have such a strong focus. And I don't want to name a, you know, any particular markets, but for some I don't think it's going to bother them at all. But I think the, the flight shaming is something that um, collectively the airlines, the airports, governments and the private sector, we all have to... Um, acknowledge that there could be an element of that that could happen that could affect the visitor flow through to New Zealand what can we do to make those visitors feel better and what's the messaging that we need to give that prospective visitor to share with their family and friends so it's it's not like you're completely embarrassed and shamed about saying I'm going on my once in a lifetime trip to New Zealand I want to feel good about that so you know we can press have a part to play with this and definitely Tourism New Zealand will have a really big strong role with our, our future messaging. Mm -hmm. Nice and, and Lisa recently at your yeah. meetings um, conference you were talking the difference between what internationals are going through with that kind of thing and what domestic is going through with the different kind of thinking as well. Do you have a view on it? Yeah I think um, I think actually Linda touched on a very important point which is around the communication and the messaging. Um, I and sitting more in Linda's camp, sorry, Suzanne, um, I, I also believe that there will be a, a, a want, a desire to travel. And unfortunately, we can't bring New Zealand closer to the rest of the world. We are where we are. So, um, But I think what, what's really important is what happens on the ground when people get here. And I think one of the things that, <coughs> excuse me, you'll see in our industry is you know, greening of events and and how are we sharing with guests, attendees, visitors, manahiri about what are some of the things and that have been put in place to make that event more carbon neutral, to make it more sustainable? Yeah, I, I quite like that. I think from this, we've got a couple of good talking points. I think we need a good Venn diagram that does our um, <laughs> tourism economy. I think that would go well in schools, considering uh, we really do struggle in, in, in a secondary school level and in a tertiary level to really show the width, the breadth of what our industry actually has on offer and also the viable careways that are there. But, you know, we, we've, we've obviously talked about rebranding and how sustainability will redefine tourism. Um, I'll come to you, Liz. Linda, first, what other actions can our industry take to redefine tourism? Um, I think a high level of engagement with our communities and our parents and our teachers, right, right across the education sector, because um, you know it all it all begins as to what are the types of conversations that are in the homes and in schools, and so you know maybe we do need a national PR campaign to try to target um, the source of where these conversations begin. Obviously, through social media, when we're looking at all the different, you know. Um, the digital native, Gen Z. What's the newest term? My oh, apologies, audience, if I can't remember the newest term. <coughs> Excuse me. 
but yeah, we have to make sure we're pushing some messages out through the um, different media channels. So it is targeting parents, teachers, uh, um, you know, 18 to 25 year, year olds, 13 to 15 year olds, you know, maybe 10 to 13 year olds. So we can build uh, this um, story of why the visitor economy, the tourism and hospitality industry is such a great career path. So I think if you come across anyone that's been in the industry more than 20 years, they may have started being a night porter in a hotel or a hotel receptionist or a cruise ship beverage staff person um, or, um, you know, a, a waitress in, in a restaurant or a cafe, but they've seen that there's these pathways for them. So I think comms, 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 but we've really got to let parents feel proud about recommending to their children, have you thought about a career in tourism? So we've still got a bit more work to do. Correct. Chris, your views, because obviously uh, TIA did a lot of work around perceptions with uh, uh, parents and caregivers and young people. Uh, what's your thoughts? Well, we, we recognise that, that, as you know, Matt, a couple of years ago, and that's uh, why uh, the whole Go With Tourism programme and, and this <laughs> this video series and everything else is happening. And uh, it is about changing perceptions, and that is a long-term game. That's not an overnight, um, and, and COVID hasn't helped, quite frankly. Uh, when when we lost so many jobs in 2020, uh, but right now, of course, there are there are, uh, once we come out of lockdown, there will be lots of jobs available again in tourism. So um, there are perceptions to work on. Uh, and in terms of what language should we use, I'd like to throw another couple of words into the mix. What do we do in tourism or in the visitor economy? We're all about providing experiences and creating memories. So we're in the memory game. And we're the experience game. That's that's why you have a that's why you're a visitor. That's why you go away from your home to somewhere else is, has, is to have a new experience and to take home lifetime memories. Now, if you think about it in that, that term, that that would inspire me to work in tourism. That I'm going to every day in my job be giving someone a fantastic experience and giving them a lifetime memory to take home. Um, you know, what could be more inspiring to go to work than that? I think that's a great one. Suzanne, what's your thoughts? Um, I might come from a tourism sector perspective, so a bit wider than, than the industry and jobs. Um, it's about tourism um, interlinking with other sectors in New Zealand. So one is one very obvious one is, is primary industries and regional development. And just speaking to some of the operators who, who shifted to domestic tourism and working really with small local businesses in quite different ways and really stimulating local economies. That's fantastic. The other one is health. Um, something we, we do in DOC is really understanding uh, mental health and how people get out in nature. So I think yeah. tourism is a vehicle, I mentioned it earlier about well-being, but really contributing to other goals. I think there's a lot to be done and said. And Lisa, finally, but not final, what's your thoughts? Well, I guess the um, one of the advantages of, of the business events sector is it is very much sits in that education space as well, but it's from a slightly different angle, though I completely agree with, with all that's been said before, um, especially about the experiences and, and, and creating dreams, Chris. I think you've been reading a little bit of our manifesto there because I think you're absolutely right. But <clears throat> we get an opportunity to invite um or create an environment for people to gather face to face because that's what people want to do. And let's face it, we would all sooner be sitting around having a direct conversation face to face instead of on this. But they come together and the impactful part of that is usually the topic and how that can be then shared out into the broader community. Um, there's a wetlands conference that's going to be held. And so talking really about um, bringing experts, bringing specialists who would never perhaps come to New Zealand or consider New Zealand or speak to New Zealanders uh, about this really important topic and sharing and imparting their professional knowledge. That is right there is the power of what we do. We enable people to share their knowledge with us while giving them an incredible experience and amazing memories to take home with them. 
I think you've all given us an, an amazing way to look at redefining tourism. I'll break it down to it starts with the education. It then goes to perceptions and breaking them very well. It goes to making sure we've got the best comms and marketing plan that we can possibly have out there. It comes to creating memorable moments, the reason why people do get out there and do what they do in our industry. And it makes sure that we're unified with interacting with other industries. 